So here we go, we're gonna talk about the Wanderer. You either hate him or you love him. Definitely one of the most controversial characters in the game. So let's talk about him. Let's talk about the character that was so highly anticipated that people saved their primo gems, fed on literal crumbs for any kind of lore for two whole years, and almost went insane trying to figure out if he was even going to be playable or not. But also at the same time, he's so polarizing that he's what a lot of people would consider to be the most hated Genshin character. A puppet consumed by a raging fire will leave behind ashes. As for what will emerge from them. Like, some people despise him. It really depends on who you ask. Now disclaimer, this video will be subjective and I think it's important for me to mention that he is one of my favorite characters in the game. But of course, I will try my best to minimize my bias. But full disclosure, I really like the Harbingers and villain characters in general. A lot of the things we are discussing in this video will also be subjective to my experience with the fandom and the game as the experience of being in the Genshin Impact community is going to be different for everyone. And I think the Wanderer or Scaramouche is the perfect character to discuss when talking about fandom experiences and just how our experience as players could be so different from one another. Because you could see him either as the most anticipated character in Genshin's history or he was the most annoying edgelord that the game shoved in your face way too many times. Was his redemption arc even necessary? Was he redeemed? Was he just misunderstood? That's what we're going to talk about today and how his polarizing personality is a big reason why people seem to forget that the Wanderer is actually one of the better written characters in the game. So strap in because apparently I have a lot to say about the Wanderer. Before we get into why and how the Wanderer became such a polarizing character, it's important to discuss his introduction in the game. Scaramouche has one of the most memorable introductions in the game. And no, I'm not talking about the way he showed up in the Delusion Factory, laughs, and then leaves almost as quickly as he appeared. No, his introduction in the Inazuma Archon quest is probably one of the most forgettable harbinger introductions we've gotten so far. I mean, compared to Tartalia, the Doctor, and most recently, the Knave, the Balladeer's introduction felt so forced and lackluster. Like Hoyo just went, oh shit, the Balladeer is from Inazuma and is also really important to the plot and we haven't had the chance to introduce him yet because there's so much going on with the Civil War and Tepe, so why not just put him in the Delusion Factory and not give him anything to do? He does nothing in the Archon quest. Now, Scaramouche definitely has a memorable storyline, but that all happened in Sumeru, which came out one year after the initial release of the Inazuma Archon quest. So for a full year, at least from patches 2.1 to 3.2, Scaramouche stayed as this brat that showed up for less than 5 minutes and was kinda mean and then we didn't see him again for a very long time. Which is why I can understand why a lot of people just didn't get the hype over Scaramouche. While a lot of the same things can be said about Dottori both being male harbingers introduced as evil, Dottori's introduction was a lot more memorable. And Dottori has some of his motivations explored in the Sumeru Archon quest too. He also played a very crucial role in Sumeru. At least it was a lot better than Balladeers because in case you forgot, the only thing we got in the Inazuma Archon quest, aside from his very brief introduction, was his backstory, which made seem significant, but that backstory was revealed through dialogue at the end of the quest. It's given to the players in the most boring way possible and that's why I can't really blame people for thinking that Scaramouche is just a bratty edgelord for a better part of a year. Now if you've played through the Unreconciled Stars event, then you would have a completely different introduction to Scaramouche. Because at least this time, it's not as forgettable. Now I consider myself to be pretty lucky to have experienced that event firsthand and I will forever be annoyed that Hoyo makes important moments like these time-gated so newer players just don't get the same experience. And the Unreconciled Stars event was as early as 1.1. It was all the way back in 2020. So it's safe to say that a lot of people didn't get to experience it unless they were day one players or went out of their way to watch the entire thing on YouTube. Which again, unless you're really interested in Scaramouche purely based on his design or his personality, somehow 
how appealing to you specifically is probably something that most players won't do. His introduction in Unreconciled Stars showcased so much more than what we got in the Inazuma Archon Quest. What we got in the Inazuma Archon Quest is just him being essentially an evil brat, which is fine, but ultimately forgettable. But in Unreconciled Stars, he was an evil, cunning, conniving, and two-faced brat, which just made the whole thing a lot more memorable and made Scaramouche a much more interesting character. To recap, we first bump into Scaramouche on our way to Liyue where he introduced himself as a vagrant from Inazuma. A friendly vagrant, might I add. Scaramouche was so friendly to the traveler, he was helpful, he smiled and made small talk but you just knew there was just something fishy about him. And honestly, he immediately stands out because of his design. Correct me if I'm wrong on this but I think that at this point, Scaramouche is the first character of Inazuma Origins that we've seen in the game, excluding Ayaka of course. Even Paimon and the Traveler point out how unique his outfit was, especially his hat. So the Traveler trusted Scaramouche and I don't blame them because he never gave us any reason to not trust him in the first place. And I love this encounter because there were hints that there was a harbinger nearby. And at the time of the event, most players probably just finished the Liyue Archon quest, so most players would connect that information to Tartalia or even Signora because both of them were just in Liyue. I know I did, maybe I'm just stupid but I knew there was something suspicious about this guy but I never expected him to be a harbinger. His attempt in murdering the traveler and their group was the perfect way of showcasing Scaramouche's viciousness and his disregard for human life. They also doubled down on this by showing how much of an asshole he was to his Fatui subordinates for literally just talking. The next time we see him is when we bumped into him while looking for Pilo speak and learning the truth about Leonard. And by this point, he didn't bother being fake and had no problems showing his true colors to the Traveler and their crew. To quickly recap on the events of Unreconciled Stars, people in Monset and Liyue were falling into a deep sleep after coming into contact with a meteorite. And thus, the Traveler, Mona, and Fischl worked together to find a way to solve this crisis and find a way to wake the people up. And in this particular cutscene, Scaramouche, who also came into contact with the core of the meteorite, woke himself up. Which I think is a great way to show that Scaramouche was special. He was not someone to be messed with on top of his already established harbinger status. It's also during this encounter that Scaramouche solidified himself as the one and only Flat Earther of Teva. He also name drops the Jester in this event. And before he leaves, he says the iconic line of So, so long, long, suckers. suckers. So can you see why I have a problem with the way he was introduced in the Inazuma Archon quest? And of course, this doesn't mean that if Scaramouche had a more memorable introduction that everyone would immediately like him because his personality is still as rotten as ever. And I completely understand if some people still don't see the appeal of his character and that's fine, different strokes for different folks. It's just that his initial introduction in the time-gated event would have given a lot more context on why so many people found him at least somewhat interesting and it wouldn't be as confusing. Now that we've already gone through his role in Unreconciled Stars, it's time to talk about his role in the Archon quests, both in Inazuma and Sumeru, and also in events. Starting with the Inazuma Archon quest, while there was initially a lot of speculation that he was going to be the main harbinger in Inazuma because that is his homeland, he, again, didn't actually do much. As established earlier, he shows up in the Delusion Factory, taunts the Traveler, and then he tries to to kill the Traveler. I'm not sure what he was doing here. He was maniacally laughing and menacingly walking towards the Traveler, so I would assume that his intent is murder, but we never really get to see what happened because Yaimiko intervened. She offered him the Electronosis and Scaramouche decided to take it and we don't see him again for the rest of the Archon quest. It's revealed later on in the optional dialogue at the end of Act 3 that Scaramouche is a puppet created by none other than a herself. It's also revealed that he's essentially gone rogue and that Scaramouche decided to cut ties with the Fatui and is nowhere to be found. I will never understand why Hoyo decided to info dump lore this important in an optional dialogue. I'm guessing that they just had no place to explore his backstory in the Inazuma Archon quest as evident by the horrible 
global pacing of Inazuma in general. But we do get crumbs of Scaramouche in events such as the Labyrinth of Warriors event where Child was actively looking for him after he stole the Electronosis. And as a Scaramouche fan, I did hope that the entire thing with Shiki Taisho was gonna be related to him in some way but it didn't. But oh ho ho, we did finally get an event that was more or less centered around him, that being the Irodori Festival. Now I didn't expect to get so much backstory in this event or even any backstory given that there were literally multiple 5 stars being featured in that event. Before getting into all that, I think it's important to mention that by this point, Scaramouche's lore has always been scattered in the game in similar fashion to Signora's lore which can be found in the Crimson Witch artifact set. Scaramouche's lore can be found in the Pale Flame set, specifically the Surpassing Cup. It can also be found in the Husk of Opulent Dreams artifact set and also the rather aged notes scattered around Tatarasuna. Going in the order of the crumbs that was revealed, the Pale Flame set came out in 1.4. It details on how he was divinely created, woke himself up from slumber, cast it aside like worthless straws, and my personal favorite, born with a face fairer than any other. It also revealed that he wandered around for many years before the Fatui found him and he joined them because apparently it looked fun. Now the husk of opulent dreams and the rather aged notes in Tatarasuna essentially detailed the same thing which is when A first put him to sleep after deciding that he was too weak to house a gnosis and leaving him in the Shake pavilion. It also detailed his time with the people of Tatarasuna like how he met Katsuragi, Mikushi Nagamasa, and how he earned the name Kabuki Mono. And most importantly, it details on how Scaramouche desired a heart. All of which we will discuss in detail later on. Did I find it annoying that Hoyo was leaving crumbs, literal crumbs of lore about Scaramouche every few months? Absolutely, because it made me impatient. But in hindsight, it was such a good way to build up hype, especially for people who are heavily invested in Genshin's lore, especially Fatui lore. And getting to see bits of that lore come to life in the Irodori festival was truly an experience. It was a lot of fun to play through the quest and go, hey, I know what they're talking about, I know what the Raiden Gokuden is. It felt like I was rewarded for paying attention and for reading an ungodly amount of text just to get any Scaramouche crumb. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about the second big event centering around Scaramouche's lore, the Irodori Festival. Again, we actually learn a lot more about Scaramouche's character and backstory in the Irodori Festival than we do in the Inazuma Archon Quest. We learned that before Scaramouche joined the Fatui, he was already a wanderer in Inazuma, and that he was also responsible for the fall of the Raiden Gokaden. Before getting into the whole thing with the Legend of the Five Kasen, which was the central plot of the Irodori Festival, the Raiden Gokaden was a group of five of the most prestigious bladesmithing schools in Inazuma. Not only were they skilled in the art of forging, families or members of the Raiden Gokuden also held important positions in the Yashiro Commission. So these families also had a lot of political influence in Inazuma. And out of the five original schools, only the Amenoma school still remains today, as in they're still active and practicing the art itself. Descendants of the Ishin art are also still alive but they aren't active, so they aren't aren't practicing the art of bladesmithing anymore because the only descendant of the Ishin art, at least the one we know of, is none other than Kaedehara Kazuha himself. What happened to the other three schools, you ask? Well, they were lost to time. During the Irodori festival, Ayato and Yaimiko for whatever reason decided to nudge the traveler and the gang towards the truth of the Raiden Gokuden using the Tale of the Five Kasen instead of just telling them like normal people. But I guess that's just Ayato and Yaimiko. Miko for you. And it works because Kazuha starts questioning his own family history after learning of how Akahito was framed in the story of the five Kasen. If you don't remember Akahito or the parallels of the cast to the characters in the legend of the five Kasen, Akahito was Kazuha, Suiko was Venti, Aono Okina was Shincho, and Sumizome was Ayaka. And of course, last but not least, Kuronushi, the man who framed Akahito, is the balladeer. To briefly recap on what happened with the Kaede the Hara clan, around a century or so ago, the Ishin school was tasked in making something really important for the shogun. I think it was some sort of diagram. Anyway, for whatever reason, these bladesmiths kept failing and producing defective products. Because, you know, 
someone was messing with the blueprints. Which is really bad because this is the request of the shogun herself. So this is a big deal. Because they kept failing and they feared punishments, the swordsmiths of the Ishin school fled. Also interesting side note, these swordsmiths actually fled to Shneshnaya with the help of the Fatui nonetheless. And one of those exiled swordsmiths actually forged Kagotsurube Ishin. And more on this later because it's so good, we love continuity in lore. Okay, back to the swordsmiths trying to escape punishment. They were chased down by Kaedehara Yoshinori and the head of the Kamisato clan at that time. But they failed to catch up with the swordsmiths because instead they ran into the balladeer. The balladeer at this time was carrying out his revenge on the Raiden Gokuden. And for what reason you ask? At the time of 2.6, which was the Irodori patch, most people would assume that it's because the Raiden Gokuden was such an integral part of Inazuma and Skaramush hates A and his homeland, therefore he wants to destroy them out of spite. Well, it's either that or he held a grudge against bladesmiths due to Mikoshi Nagamasa executing Katsuragi, who we know was Karamushi's friend thanks to the Tataru Suna notes and also has of opulent dreams. We later find out why Katsuragi was executed for misconduct, but this is revealed much later alongside the real reasons Karamush held so much hatred and rage towards bladesmiths. Okay, so back to the Irodori festival. See, during their encounter, Kazuha's great-grandfather was spared by the balladeer and he started asking if he knew anyone by the name of Niwa, which at the time was such a massive lore bomb. I believe that this was the first time ever that the name Niwa was mentioned in the game. And considering how important Niwa is later on, I will always be annoyed that this is yet again a time-gated quest. After learning that Kaedehara Yoshinori was indeed related to Niwa and that he was adopted into the Kaedehara clan, the balladeer shows a very very rare act of mercy. The Kaedehara, Niwa, and Akame clan were all practitioners of the Ishin art, and I assume they were closely together, hence when Yoshinori's father disappeared, he was taken in by the Kaedehara clan. It's never explained why Yoshinori's father disappeared. This implies that Yoshinori's father was the Niwa he Sahide. So that would explain why the head of the Niwa clan suddenly disappeared but it couldn't have been Hisahide because he was murdered over 400 years ago. It doesn't make sense timeline wise so I guess Yoshinori's father was just one of those dads who went to get milk and never came back. The balladeer then says, tell her this, my name is Kunikuzushi which if you want to translate it can be defined as country destroyer or usurper. This is why you can't escape the edgelord allegations Skara, and then he leaves, leaving a traumatized Kaedehara Yoshinori and an injured Kamisato ancestor. After much debate, they both decided that it was wise to keep their encounter with the balladeer a secret out of fear that he would come after their families again had they exposed the truth. The head of the Kamisato clan unfortunately died soon after and Kaedehara Yoshinori decided to close down the family business. Now I think all of this is so important in understanding Skaramush as a character. At this point in the timeline, Skaramush was already in the Fatui and he messed with the Raiden Gokaden purely out of blind hatred towards A and Niwa, who we later learn was what he considered to be his second betrayal. Yet when faced with the descendant of Niwa's, he couldn't bring himself to kill him, despite already killing three whole ass clans before he even went after the Ishin school. Now this is my own interpretation, you can disagree with me, but I think this moment shows how A was ultimately kinda right about how Skaramouche having emotions would result in roadblocks. He failed to complete what he set out to do because his emotions got the better of him. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing that Skaramouche was able to show mercy and not commit murder of innocent people, but what A needed was an unfeeling puppet that could carry on her will on an unwavering and unchanging Inazuma, her will of eternity, which she later got in the form of the Shogun puppet. In the Husk of Opulent Dreams artifact set, he does say that he became bored of taking revenge on the bladesmiths, but I call bullshit. I'm not buying for a second that he stopped his murder spree of the bladesmiths because he got bored. And coincidentally, this happens right after he came face to face with Niwa's descendant. I'm just not buying it. This whole thing with the Raiden Gokuden is also a big deal in Inazuma's history because obviously it destroyed the Kaedehara clan. And because Yoshinori and the Kamisato clan decided to keep their encounter with the balladeer a secret, this was deemed as incompetence of the Yashiro Commission by the Raiden Shogun. And it led to the Kamisato clan 
falling from grace, and they only regained their political standing back during Ayato's time as the head of the Kamisato clan. If you look at Ayato and Ayaka's lore, it's also implied that their parents passed away because the Kamisato clan had fallen into hard times due to this event. The point is, Karamushi's anger and the way he lashed out hurt so many people and it lasted for literal multiple generations. And it's important to remember that no matter how you see it, most of his action during his time as the balladeer is evil. Him mocking Tepe's death and being both verbally and physically abusive towards his subordinates was bad. But this, I'm glad they showed the gravity of his actions through this event. He killed a lot of innocent people, he caused a lot of pain, and having a tragic backstory does not excuse any of it. The only gripe that I have with this event is how it's, again, time limited. It wouldn't be a video of mine if I don't complain about Hoyo's choice to keep insanely important character lore locked behind time-gated events. With that being said, was he ever redeemed in the story? Can we even consider his storyline in Sumeru to be his redemption arc? Does he even need or deserve a redemption arc? Since so many people already love him for being evil, imagine the outrage when it was hinted he would go through a redemption arc. A big chunk of Scaramouche fans were just not having it, including me. I was slightly worried that they would somehow force the balladeer into a redemption arc after just establishing how he destroyed lives in the Irodori festival. Because as you know, in the world of Genshin, in order for a character to become playable, they have to be on at least somewhat good terms with the traveler. Because canonically, all of the character voice lines are just basically the characters talking to the traveler while they go on a journey together. And this concept has always bothered me because it doesn't make much sense. I'm confused on how someone as busy as let's say Ayato or Kaching would even have the time to travel with the Traveler. But let's just ignore this for now. Tangent aside, you can see why Scaramouche fans were stuck between a rock and a hard place. Because on one hand, it seems like Scaramouche will have to be redeemed and turned somewhat good in order to be playable or he'll suffer the same fate as Signora. We do know, however, that a villain can become playable if the Traveler tolerates them because we already have one in the form of Tartalia. But the thing is, the Traveler's sentiments towards the Balladeer and Tartalia are vastly different. While the Traveler is mostly wary of Child and distrusts him a lot, they hate the Balladeer, and rightfully so. Did Child also try to kill the Traveler? Yes. Did Child put thousands of innocent people at risk? Also yes. But the Traveler has also spent a lot of time with the nicer side of him, all the way back in Liyue. They even share an understanding on what it means to go to extreme lengths in order to protect your siblings. Does this excuse or redeem all of Child's actions in Liyue. Of course not, he's still very much a terrible person for doing those things, but the Traveler can now tolerate him to an extent. The Balladeer, on the other hand, the Traveler has met him four times, and three out of those four times, he tried to murder the Traveler. Tartalia was at least nice to the Traveler and has even said multiple times that he's only doing his job. While Scaramouche did not, he mocked Tepe's death because he knew it would get a reaction action out of the Traveler. He tried to kill the Traveler multiple times solely because he felt like it. And if you've watched my videos, I don't like Tepe as a character, but I still think it's justified that the Traveler is enraged by how Scaramouche belittled him. So going into Sumeru, I was worried about how Hoyo would redeem him. And keep in mind, we are going into this fresh from Inazuma, so Hoyo hasn't even redeemed themselves when it comes to character writing. But honestly, after playing through the first two acts of the Sumeru, Archonquest and then Tignari's quest, I wasn't too worried about how Scaramouche was going to end up. And I think I was kinda right. I think Hoyo did a fairly decent job in his redemption arc, if you want to call it that. Was it perfect? Of course not. Now, I actually wouldn't call the events in Sumeru as a redemption arc because he was not redeemed, but we'll get into that. To recap, after getting the Electronosis from Yaimiko, Scaramouche made his way to Sumeru where he willingly cooperated with Dutore and the Sages of the Academia in order to become a god, because he has a very obvious and severe god complex. He has always viewed his existence as divine, and because he was created from divinity and was supposed to hold the very item that is the symbol 
symbol of divinity, that being the gnosis, he was under the impression that this was his purpose. And as we know, Scaramouche has always craved a heart, and he probably saw the gnosis as something symbolic, like it's his heart, the one thing that he's always wanted. During this time, the traveler slowly starts to get an understanding of Scaramouche's motivations. They were literally shown his past and the source of his rage, that being the three betrayals that ultimately shaped Scaramouche's distorted worldview. Don't get me wrong, the traveler still hates Scaramouche, but they were able to empathize enough to warn him that if he does go through with his plan to infuse his consciousness into the divine knowledge capsules, there's a very high risk that Scaramouche himself will cease to exist, that he will literally lose himself in the process. And wouldn't you know it, Scaramouche is absolutely fine with this. Because he believes that this is his calling, that this was his purpose, so he was always fine with the idea of being erased as long as he can become a god. This is such an important moment in my opinion because it makes his very irrational decisions later on in the interlude quest a lot more sense. He even points out that the traveler is starting to care about him and is acting kinda like a friend. He also had the audacity to tell the traveler to drop their guardian complex despite his very own obvious god complex because he thinks humans aren't worth the trouble. In his words, humans are a species that can only find bliss in ignorance. And the traveler rightfully calls him out on this. He is still keeping his connection to Hypatia, who if you don't remember is the first scholar that we bump into in Sumeru, the one who was trying to connect her mind to Ermansel and accidentally saw Scaramouche's past instead and started worshipping him. The balladeer then goes on and on about how she He's worthy to be his first follower now that he's a god and blah blah blah. But the traveler doesn't buy this because they've seen his past too and we all know what he truly wants is connection. A human connection. That's why he desires a heart so badly. He probably thinks that in order to have connection and to feel human emotions, he needs a heart. And I've always found it interesting that despite having very human emotions such as anger and grief and really just anger and grief for most of his life, the bad Aladir wasn't able to piece together that he doesn't need a heart to feel or to become human. He has had intense emotions quite literally ever since he was created and I think that's both the irony and brilliance of this character. He failed to recognize that he's always had the most human thing that one could have. And it's not a heart, it's the ability to feel emotions, experience joy and sorrow. Even Nahida says this directly to him much later on but here she says it a lot better than me. Whoever has tasted the joys and sorrows of life in the human realm is human. Whoever has loved and lost, cried with grief, howled with rage at the tragedy of death that eclipses the miracle of life, they are human too. <sighs> A thought he was a failure because she needed something that wasn't human. She needed an unfeeling puppet. But of course, Scaramouche never learned this because he never really had any guidance. The people that truly cared about him were ripped away from him before he got the chance to learn anything. And the only other person that tried to give him some perspective about this heart he wanted so badly died. And his death broke Scaramouche and he brushed off everything he'd said as a lie. Everyone in his life either abandoned him like A or lied to him like Niwa. So I guess, again, while it is an extremely irrational conclusion, we can understand how he got there. I've always found the way they portrayed this kid in that one cutscene kind of funny because it just made it look like Scaramouche was angry at him for dying. But it's not that. He's angry at the kid, someone he saw was so similar to him that understood him and finally someone who he connected with promised that they would be together forever and then was unable to fulfill that promise. After after being defeated by Nahida and the Traveler, Scaramouche agrees to help Nahida out in some Ermansel business. And unbeknownst to him, this was a part of Nahida's plan to show him the truth. The real truth about what happened in Tatarasuna. Turns out, two out of the three betrayals that happened in his life was caused by none other than the Tore himself. And Scaramouche snaps. He starts laughing maniacally and screaming as he should, really. And in that moment, I truly do feel for him. Because imagine learning that 
that your life, everything you've believed in, turns out to be a lie. Top it all off, it's caused by someone he considers to be an ally. Don't get me wrong, Scaramouche sees the Tore as below him for being human, and they do not share any special bond or anything like that, but he still trusts him enough to join the Tore in his grand research project, only to find out that this same man that he had trusted was essentially responsible for everything that went wrong in his life. The Tori directly and indirectly caused the death of all of his friends in Tatarasuna. The Tori was the one who encouraged the use of crystal marrow in the Tatarasuna furnace, even though he knows it's filled with the lingering hatred of Orobashi which then turned into Tatarigami, which causes the people in Tatarasuna to fall ill. This is also the same event that caused Karamush to go to Narukami Island seeking help from A, who coincidentally, in that same year, finally succeeded in making the Shogun puppet and isolated herself for eternity, so she wasn't even in any position to see him. Skaramush then asked to see Yae Miko, and Miko did send help to Tatarasuna. It's important to acknowledge that despite her disdain towards Skaramush's existence, and how she always knew that he was trouble, which to her credit, she was right, Yae Miko did try her best to help with the situation. It's just that she was too late, and I guess at this point, Skaramouche was already hysterical enough and viewed A's refusal to see him as her doubling down on her abandonment, and he dismissed Yae Miko's reassurance. Niwa, who was in charge of Tatarasuna and the furnace, volunteered to sacrifice his own life in order to cleanse the now corrupt furnace. But before he had the chance to do so, he made the mistake of confronting the Tore, who was disguised as Asher at the time, a mechanic from Fontaine, and then he got stabbed in the back, literally. The Tore then took Niwa's heart from his body and inserted it into his device, told everybody, including Skaramouche, that Niwa ran away, and then gave that device to Skaramouche so that he can cleanse the corrupt furnace, claiming that Skaramouche or the Kabukimono was their only hope now that Niwa had run away. This was the Tore wanting to get a sense of the divine puppet's durability and durable he was. Skaramouche came out alive and the device containing Niwa's heart protected him. Of course, he wasn't told this. Instead, he was told that Niwa murdered someone and gave Skaramouche their heart because it's the one thing he's longed for before running away. Skaramouche was disgusted by this. Even then, he was able to recognize this as an act of cruelty and he was conflicted that an act so cruel protected him and kept him alive. Scaramouche or the Kabukimono, the naive fledgling that he was, believed this lie and considered it as his second betrayal. He was so hurt by this incident with Niwa, he continued to harbor so much hatred towards bladesmiths for literal centuries. And this was the main motive behind his revenge on the Raiden Gokuden, which as we have established, had ramifications that lasted through multiple generations. It's also important to note that the incident in Tatarasuna is also the reason the child Skaramouche later befriended is orphaned. His parents used to work in the furnace but then fell ill and never came back, which left the child to fend for himself and I don't think this is ever specified or directly confirmed but it's not too far-fetched to assume that the child himself was probably sick due to the Tatarigami that was unleashed by the furnace. So Dottore indirectly also caused his third betrayal. Imagine standing there and learning all of that, all of his anger, hatred, and basically everything he believed in turned out to be a lie. That he was manipulated into hating the only people who cared about him. And because of that hate, he has caused a lot, and I do mean a lot of pain, towards humans, aka the only group of people that were willing to accept him despite his differences and even treated him like family, as one of their own. Niwa even says that he and Nagamasa saw Kabukimono as one of their own in his last moments. I don't know why he said this to the doctor, of all people like my guy i know you're dying and you're trying to make a point but this is the last thing that the doctor will tell the puppet what are you doing anyway all of that understandably is a lot for anyone to take in so what does karamush do once he learns the truth about his life he tries to delete himself from existence now a lot of people in the community have seen this action as an allegory for him trying to unalive himself after all hoyo was never subtle about karamush wishing that he was never 
ever born in the first place. Scaramouche obviously realized just how much he messed up and how all of the violence and revenge towards humans he committed throughout the last few centuries were basically unjustified. So it makes sense that the first thing he did was to erase himself from existence, to undo what he did, because in his mind, if he never existed, then none of those bad things that happened to his friends, nor the bad things that he himself did to countless innocent humans would have happened. And I have seen some people think that Scaramouche trying to erase himself from existence is him not being able to handle his guilt and mistakes. And while I do think some part of that is true, I think it's again more that he thinks the world would be a better place if he had never existed. We have seen this sentiment in the last act of the Sumeru Archon quest after all. He never had a problem in ceasing to exist as long as he gets to fulfill his purpose. And obviously this doesn't work because while everyone in Teyvat except for the Traveler forgot about him and his existence, he wasn't able to undo any of the events that have transpired in the past. History was just rewritten, not erased. Scaramouche, now the Wanderer, is back to being a blank slate. He had never met the people of Tatarasuna, the Raiden Gokaden was destroyed by someone else, the sixth Harbinger seat was just empty, and there was no one piloting the giant robot in Sumeru. Now there was a lot of discourse in the community and even amongst Scaramouche fans when it's revealed that everyone in Teyvat just forgot about him. This includes myself. I have mixed feelings about how Hoyo chose this route for him because to an extent, this does feel like a cop-out. Now that Scaramouche is essentially erased, he doesn't have to deal with his mistakes and be held accountable for all of his actions. And his actions as Scaramouche were evil, there's no denying that. And it eliminates so many potential confrontations with other characters like Dottore and A. While I agree that this eliminates a lot of interesting dynamics that we could have seen on screen like Scaramouche and the other Harbingers, I don't think it was a cop-out and it wasn't an easy redemption arc. Because I personally think Scaramouche wasn't redeemed. I mean, just because everyone in Teyvat forgot about him, that doesn't mean that he automatically is redeemed as a character. He is still very much held accountable by the Traveler who at this point has grown a better understanding of him. And at the end of the interlude quest, he's also held accountable by Nahida and most importantly, he holds himself accountable. As the Wanderer, he had every opportunity to live his new life without his old painful memories. Memories that traumatized him so badly that it literally made him evil. Nahida even asked him if he was sure because this version of the Wanderer who never knew pain is probably the closest he'll ever be to a normal human being. No one manipulated him and he was basically free to do whatever he wanted. And most importantly, he had the option to not live with the guilt of the pain he'd inflicted on others. He was no longer haunted by the thoughts of abandonment and betrayals and basically the fact that his found family all died because of him. Yet, he still wanted all of it back. And I think personally, it's because of two things. One, he has always felt like he lacked purpose both as the balladeer and the wanderer. As the balladeer, he thought that his purpose was to obtain the gnosis and become a god. It was why he was created in the first place after all. This delusion came from centuries of unresolved trauma, manipulation, and anger and it obviously didn't work out so he's once again left without purpose. As the wanderer, however, he never faced any trauma but the void still exists. He still struggles with finding a purpose and once he learns the truth, he finally gets to choose what he wants to live for. And that's to live despite the pain and suffering that life brings. Despite the unforgivable sins that he had committed and his purpose from that day onwards is to make peace with himself and slowly atone for his past mistakes. His purpose is to be human. He's finally free to choose his own purpose in life and to slowly find a way to be free from the events of the past that has haunted him for so long. And it makes the moment he receives an animal vision all the more impactful, don't you think? I think Inversion of Genesis is a really good quest that has had substantial amount of setup over the years. It is a story about a character that Hoyo has teased time and time again from as early as the first patch update. But as good as the interlude quest is, it's ultimately not a redemption story, let alone a redemption arc. 
arc. Therefore, the Wanderer is not really redeemed because his redemption arc literally just started with that quest. He only chose to change his way of life at the end of the interlude quest. And with the help of Nahida's guidance, the Wanderer can make steps to heal and atone for his past mistakes and hopefully discover what his true purpose is along the way. Like who better to guide him than the goddess of wisdom herself? The next time we see him as the Wanderer is, I believe, the Parade of Providence where he's basically sentenced to college by Nahida. And he accidentally just became a scholar. He wrote multiple essays to correct misconceptions made about the Tatarasuna incident. He also wrote a paper on societal issues in Inazuma, which I find to be hilarious. Like he can finally criticize A's leadership and politics and take out all of his anger on something productive. I never thought that it would be in the form of a research paper, but I like that it implies this is how he sticks it to the man or woman in this case. Man, Nahida sure knows what she's doing. Now that we've talked about most of his history, let's talk about his personality. Because the most polarizing thing about the Wanderer is his personality. So we have to talk about it. He also does go through the most personality changes in the game, at least up until this point. Starting with the Kabuki Mono, it's been described that his personality during this time is that of a naive newborn child. He's often compared to a fledgling. He's a blank slate. And because he was so naive, it was very easy for the doctor to manipulate him. And I do like that we got to see a glimpse of how he would have turned out if he had never met the doctor or was manipulated by him. That wanderer in the inversion of Genesis is a reflection of what the Kabuki Mono would have become. He was very polite and gentle and was helpful to the point that it's suspicious to a lot of people, even Paimon. Now, while a lot of people did like this nice, innocent wanderer, a lot of people still preferred his Scaramouche personality. To a lot of people, Scaramouche being evil is why he's appealing as a character in the first place. And yes, I'm one of those people. I have always liked villains, especially damaged villains like Scaramouche. I think villains are usually a lot more complex than most protagonists. Of course, this is not always the case, but for Scaramouche specifically, he obviously has a lot of layers and complexity to his character, which is why he's so polarizing. It's really hard for people to categorize him as either good or bad because that dichotomy doesn't exist for him. Yes, he's done a lot of evil things, but he's also now trying to take accountability for his mistakes. And later, Labeling him as good because he's recognized his mistake would undermine a lot of the nuance of his character the same way brushing him off as an edgelord would. Because he's neither of those things. Ironically, Scaramouche is one of the most human characters in Genshin, at least in terms of writing. A lot of people, including myself, can relate to his struggles. I mean, I've never committed war crimes and I hope none of you have either, but his self-hatred, his desire for purpose, his fear of abandonment, grief, anger, hopelessness, are all very human emotions. And getting to see him going from being completely consumed by anger to slowly healing is a fascinating journey. It's why so many people like him despite his rotten personality. And villains tend to be a lot more unpredictable and Scaramouche was unpredictable. He was a two-faced bitch when we first met him and he says cryptic things and then he leaves. He was very entertaining and people are into that. And yes, I'm people. It's also why I'm so glad Hoyo decided to keep his original personality despite the balladeer being erased from existence, his current personality, as rotten as he is, is a result of his experiences. Mostly bad experiences, but it is what makes him human. It's what makes him, well, him. The nicer version of Wanderer is cute and all, but that is not who he actually is because he remained a blank slate. Most of our personalities as humans are shaped through our experiences, both the good and the bad, and it doesn't remain stagnant. People can change for the better or for worse and it's just a part of life and a part of human nature. And we have seen the good side of the Wanderer making a comeback now that he's had more positive things in his life and isn't being consumed by anger or being manipulated by a literal psychopath. The most recent example would be him offering his water to a dying Thignari during one of the Darshan competition because my god look at him get this man out of the desert. Yes he probably never needed the water because 
he's a puppet, but it's still a nice gesture. And it is light years away from what he used to do to his Fatui subordinates. This is the same guy that slapped people for seemingly just standing there. He's still rough around the edges, but you can see that he's growing and that he's healing. And I think it's really cool of Hoyo to show all of that on screen. And on the main quest, nonetheless. It's not a Scaramouche video if we don't talk about his relationship with the Electro Archon. A. She is the one who created him after all and gave him severe mommy issues. But that aside, A remains one of the most important figures in the Wanderer's life, even if he technically never met her. It's canon that he sees her as a mother and has always seen her as someone who abandoned him. She is the very first betrayal and what I think is the hardest betrayal for him to move past. Because after he rukadevatat himself from existence, A doesn't even remember him. So how is is he supposed to get closure on something that A doesn't even remember? Now, I think that they have one of the most complex relationships in the game because players are usually divided when it comes to Scaramouche and A. It also kind of bothers me that people tend to forget that the reason A abandoned Scaramouche in the first place is because he'd shown to have human emotions and she took pity on him. She knew that this puppet that she made is capable of suffering and therefore she saw putting him to sleep was the best option to make sure he doesn't suffer. Again, in high hindsight, this was a terrible mistake, but A was always a warrior first. She couldn't have possibly foreseen that Scaramouche would have seen this as a form of abandonment and rejection. To me, she does care for him in her own way, as evident by her not wanting to interfere in his life despite knowing he woke up and is wandering around and killing people. I would assume she knows all of this because in her original voice line, it does say Kunikuzushi, and Yai Miko knows, so she has to know. And it's not like she's completely completely clueless just because she is in the plane of euthymia. And she did leave him with that feather that tied him back to her. Again, it's definitely not what Scaramouche needed at all, but to me, this was proof that A at least somewhat cared about him in her own way. Yes, it's the bare minimum, but A was never the pinnacle of emotional intelligence. The community will either blame A for abandoning him or they will blame Scaramouche for basically turning evil and not being able to deal with his emotions. A was never someone who understood nor was she equipped to deal with emotions and when she created Scaramouche, she was dealing with the most intense grief she has ever felt in her life. She just lost her twin sister Makoto, all of her friends died and now she is set on an unchanging eternity. And after getting her hands on some Chondria knowledge, she began her quest in creating a puppet. Did she know that what she did caused Scaramouche to have extreme self-worth and abandonment issues? No, I don't think so. A did what she did probably because she thought it was for the best. Again, her solution to her own grief is to lock herself up in another dimension for all of eternity. She had the emotional intelligence of a coffee table at this point in the timeline. There was no shot in hell that A could have known that what she did was wrong. She did what she did out of ignorance. Do I think all of that justifies what she did? No, of course not. But it makes sense for someone like A to think that this was the best thing she could have done for Scarlet. So it doesn't really surprise me that she did an oopsie this bad. This also in no way shape or form justifies Scaramouche's crimes because he still chose to feed into his hatred and anger. Yes, he's manipulated by Dottore for most of his life but as we have established, a tragic backstory does not excuse the pain he's inflicted on others. What's interesting is that the Wanderer still keeps the feather that A gave to him even until now. We can see it clearly in his Wanderer attire and he never threw it away even after regaining his memories. So clearly, it still holds a lot of significance for him, even if the memory of his mother is that of pain and abandonment. Maybe it's symbolic because it's the last thing that connects him to Inazuma now that the balladeer is erased. I just think that it's a neat detail that they decided to keep. Now, one of the biggest issues I have with the balladeer erasing himself from history is that we probably will never get a resolution of A and the Wanderer. And I get that this doesn't have to happen, but I do think some confrontation needs to happen between them in order for the Wanderer to make peace with his first betrayal. He can of course do that in other ways, seeing that there isn't much of a choice and perhaps the 
this might even be the healthier option for him. A full-on confrontation with A might just reopen old wounds and who knows, maybe because they're both absolutely horrible at handling emotions, it would do a lot more harm than good. They don't have to reconcile either and he doesn't have to forgive her but I think any kind of resolution to his first betrayal would have been really nice. Now that we went over A, it's only natural that we go over another mother figure in the Wanderer's life and that is Nahida. Now huge disclaimer, Nahida being the Wanderer's adoptive mother or aunt is largely just a fandom joke. It is fanon but I do think they have one of the most wholesome dynamics in the game, especially with how they were portrayed in those Lilo and Stitch memes. They have one of the most wholesome dynamics in the game like every time they are on screen together after the inversion of Genesis, it's always Nahida tricking him into participating in events, forcing him to socialize, and even forcing him to go back to school. And she even sorts the Wanderer into Fahumana too, which is the darshan that focuses on history and social sciences. She probably does this because she feels it would help him in finding ways to make peace with his past. And I'm sorry that it's just too wholesome for my heart. Nahida is also the first person after his friends in Tatarasuna that seem to genuinely care about him. And she also understood the source of his trauma underneath all of his anger. She is the first to believe that this evil irredeemable being, and she says so herself that he's evil, can still be saved. And most importantly, she recognized that with proper guidance, the wanderer can heal. And while all of his past sins can never be undone and some may never even be forgiven, he can still do good things and that he doesn't need to be tied down by his mistakes for the rest of his life. Life. Leave it to the Archon of Wisdom to see all of that when everyone else, including Wanderer himself, thought that he was a lost cause. Nahida went out of her way so that the Wanderer could learn the truth about his past and then let him make his own decisions on what he wants to do with his life. It's important to remember that while she does all of this, she's also holding him accountable for all of his mistakes. They both recognize that he's not magically a good person now that he's essentially helping her and a college student. He still has a lot of work to do and they both recognize that he's basically a prisoner in Sumeru. And Nahida is probably the first person, at least in a long time, who was completely honest with him. She is honest about how his past experiences in the Abyss and with the Fatui can be beneficial to her. And that's why she helped him in learning the truth. She probably knows that this was probably the only way that the Wanderer is going to agree to help her, at least agreeing while being on his own terms. Because she understands how damaged the Wanderer is emotionally and doesn't understand the concept of trust. Everything to him is transactional. He needs to be useful to Nahida in order to feel that he has worth. And this does work as we see in the Parade of Providence despite his nagging and snark, he still willingly helps Nahida and he's a lot softer to her than he is to any other character in the game. So he's probably warming up to her and deep down he does realize that Nahida has no ill intentions towards him. He's just not ready to admit that after being abandoned and betrayed so many times in his life. The Wanderer, in a way, is good for Nahida too. They're both immortal, so no one has to tragically outlive the other in this friendship. And while Nahida is intelligent, she's not much of a fighter. Plus, she is still trying to understand the world around her after being caged for 500 years, and the Wanderer can protect her in a fight if needed, or just offer a bit of his nihilistic worldview. At the end of the day, Nahida treats him like she would treat any other human being, and to me, that's beautiful. I really like found family dynamics so you can see why I love these two a lot. She's the person that offered him guidance that he so desperately needs. And I think that's what makes the Wanderer respect her outside of her incredible intelligence and benevolence of course. Unfortunately for us, Scaramouche decided to ditch the Fatui before we got to see him interact with his co-workers. Like the things I would give to see Scaramouche in A Winter's Night Lazo. That trailer set the internet on fire. You remember that trailer. I'm pretty sure you remember what you were doing when it dropped and how you just revealed the designs of every harbinger all at once. Because I sure do. And God, the drip in that video. Like, I'm fine with the Wonders redesign in Sumeru, but seeing him in full Fatui attire with their white coats and all would have been really cool. Anyway, back to his relationship with the other harbingers. It's safe to say that he's not on great terms with any of them, but he does live for the drama as evidenced by this lovely voice line. <sighs> What I wouldn't give to take you to one of the Harbinger's banquets. <laughs> the extreme lengths they'll go to to get out of the missions they dislike. <laughs> it's truly a pity that only the two of us are here. A party of two won't have any good drama. 
Honestly, I do hope Hoyo shows more of the Harbingers together or at least one of these banquets. If it's not obvious by now, I love the Harbingers and seeing that they are a group made up of the most unhinged people in Teyvat makes me want to know more about them. Like we're just now getting to know the Knave and this is what Scaramouche had to say about her. Scaramouche, who at this point is deranged enough to not only destroy entire bloodlines of innocent people, abuses subordinates for seemingly no reason, can still call her crazy and a wolf in sheep's clothing. He's also the one implying that the rooster is keeping child's family hostage and has roasted him in two separate voice lines. In summary, he has nothing nice to say about his co-workers and I find that hilarious. Out of all the harbingers we need to talk about, it's obviously the Tory. Because this man has essentially manipulated Scaramouche into turning evil. Do I think the Tory is fully to blame for how Scaramouche ended up? Yes, but at the same time he's not fully to blame for all of the evil deeds that Scaramouche committed during his time as a Fatui harbinger. As the balladeer, Scaramouche decided to kill innocent people on his own. The Tori didn't make him do that. It doesn't matter that he was manipulated into hating humans. He himself chose to hurt others and I personally think that he has no one but himself to blame. And I think Scaramouche to an extent recognizes this, which is again why his first instinct was to erase himself from Ermansel instead of trying to erase the Tori after learning the truth behind Niwa's murder. It's not to say that he doesn't hold a grudge against Dottore because look at this beautiful voice line, but I have seen people try to excuse everything Scaramouche did just because Dottore manipulated him into being evil. Dottore is responsible for a lot of horrible things, but no one is responsible for Scaramouche's crimes other than Scaramouche himself. The only other time we get to see him interact with the Harbinger is during a flashback with Senora, and boy do I love this scene. I love this interaction. There's so much snark in every single line. It's beautiful. It's like two hags being passive aggressive with each other before getting into a cat fight. And I think it's very fitting for two very old unhinged immortal beings. Which is why I will forever be sad and annoyed that we will never get interactions like this again. At least not with the Wanderer. Now this one is a bit different because they never canonically met and since the balladeer erased himself from existence, Kazuha doesn't even know the truth about Kunikuzushi and how the balladeer was responsible for the Raiden Gokadin's demise. But I'm going to discuss Kazuha here anyway because they are in some way parallels or foils to one another. Even the Wanderer himself has this voice line about how they both have animal visions and Kazuha was the only person in history that was able to block the Muso no Hitotachi, which is something that the Wanderer seems to take great pleasure in. And also the fact that Kazuha is literally the descendant of Niwa. And if you remember those bladesmiths that ran away to Shinishnaya, the ones from the Ishin school, one of those men actually created Kagotsurube Ishin, and this sword has a very interesting parallel to the balladeer's story. And it just so happens that this was the focus of Kazuha's story quest. The Wanderer is responsible for the fall of the Kaidehara clan, and just a lot of bloodshed in Inazuma in general. Which kind of parallels Kagotsurube Ishin in a way like they both have Inazuman roots, through some twist of fate ended up in Shishnaya, became more and more violent, and both of them ended up making their way back to Inazuma for revenge. Really, really interesting parallels. And I think you're required to play through Kazuha's story quest before starting the Wanderer's interlude. Do correct me if I'm wrong on this because I already played through Kazuha's story quest by the time the Wanderer's interlude came out. The Wanderer also told the Traveler that he wanted the descendants of the Raiden Gokaden to learn the truth about their ancestors' demise. So if Kazuha and the Wanderer ever did meet, I think it would be really interesting. Despite being similar in a lot of ways, they're also vastly different. Kazuha is forgiving and while he has suffered from grief and loss and anger and essentially emotionally beaten down to the dirt, he's always been able to process them in a healthy way and move on from his hardships. It's very different from the Wanderer who succumbed to his rage and hatred. Now obviously this is a bit of an unfair comparison because Kazuha was never manipulated into hating mankind by the doctor for hundreds of years but the point I'm trying to make here is that they both have been beaten down by life time and time again, yet they chose to walk completely different paths. Kazuha could have just easily blamed the death of his friend on Kujosara and the Shogun, but he never did. And this is just mostly speculation. If they ever did meet, and if Kazuha were to find out about what the Wanderer did to his family, he'd probably find it in his heart to forgive him and even help the Wanderer in his journey of self-healing, the same way he did for Kagotsurube Ishin. Of course, again, complete speculation. I'm just going off of what I think would make sense 
for Kazuha as a character. Kazuha is just too gentle to hate or hold any grudges, especially the version of Kazuha after the events of the Inazuma R conquest. Kazuha was able to forgive and understood the reason as to why Kujosara killed his friend. She didn't deliver the killing blow, but she was the one who defeated him in the duel before the throne. She was the one who enforced the vision hunt decree. Kazuha has every right to be angry with her, but no, he was civil and he's able to move past a lot of his grief as the story progresses. Kazuha's entire character arc is about moving on from the past, while the Wanderer was about how he was unable to do so. So is the Wanderer hated or loved? Again, it would depend on which side of the Genshin Impact community you're on, but subjectively speaking, on my corner of the internet, he is popular. Now, I'm a bit miffed to refer to the sales graphs we usually see floating around either Twitter or Reddit because it's usually just iOS sales in China and it isn't really reflective of the character's popularity. So are there any metrics that we could use to measure the character's popularity? I don't think so, unless Hoyo decides to release their actual combined sales numbers for each character. Because again, the popularity of a certain character is very subjective and different depending on where you are. Like you could say Tartalia is a much more popular character in Japan than he is anywhere else in the world purely because he has higher engagement numbers in Genshin's official Twitter account and how there is just a lot of hype around him from the Japanese fandom. And Kokomi, despite her low sales, people loved her design and she is a popular character in the English community, especially in the community where people just don't care about the meta or gameplay, at least way back in the day. And while it took some time for people to realize that she is a good unit, she has always been popular, purely because of her design. But all of that really depends on who you ask. Which is why I don't like blanket statements like, oh, people hate this character in the Chinese fandom. Like, I'm sure if you've made it this far into the video, you are aware of the Wanderer drama, if you can call it that, that went viral on Reddit a few months ago. And while I'm not denying that those types of behavior do happen and we should condemn people who would harass others over a freaking video game character, I think it's also wrong to say that he's a hated character in the CN community or that everyone in the CN community shares the same sentiment. Now, I'm not Chinese and I don't speak the language, so I will link the Reddit post about the Wanderer drama below. I don't really want to get into all of the details of that here because there are just a lot of serious allegations being made in the original thread and I don't really want to talk about it because it really literally hurts my head. But I will say, in every video game or every fandom, there will always be bad apples and they are usually the loudest. It's always best to not engage with them in any way because your brain cells will deteriorate and these types of people just do not deserve any attention. Because the CN community is huge. Like China has over 1 billion citizens. Even if the Genshin community is only 1% of the population, that is still 10 million people. And if 1% of those players are toxic, that's still a whopping 100,000 people. It would be like saying everyone in the English speaking community hates A because someone wrote a long post on Reddit about why she's terrible and it got a lot of upvotes. And while a lot of people do hate her, it's just a fact that a lot of people also love her. Same goes for the Wanderer and every other character in Genshin. And I think it's horrible that some people can act so vicious over a bunch of pixels. At the end of the day, this is just a video game. So there you have it, the Wanderer is a character that Hoyo has obviously put a lot of thought into. He's not just an edgelord nor is he the innocent misunderstood sad boy that some people make him out to be. There's just a lot of layers to him and I think that's what makes him so appealing to so many people to the point that he's become a fan favorite, at least in my corner of the internet. He's not without his flaws, but he's definitely very entertaining every time he shows up. He has a really deep connection to the lore of Inazuma and the Fatui, and he was allowed to show a lot of emotions and to make mistakes, like terrible mistakes, and then learn from them, which is all I could ask for from a character in this silly gacha game. I also want to add that it's kind of weird that he doesn't have a story quest yet. Like, we are almost a year into his release as a playable character, and yet we still don't have a story quest. Hopefully Hoyo is saving it for something significant and I hope his story quest would have the same quality of writing as Nouvellet's because wow, that story quest made me emotional. I never thought I would care so much about Melusine's before that quest. So yeah, honestly, props to you Hoyo. That was a great quest. And with that, we have reached the end of my Wanderer video. Thank you so much for watching and do let me know on what characters you want to see me talk about next. Subscribe if you want and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!